Let's have a look at a curve sketching question. So this uh, question is asking us to, to sketch the function f of x equals e to the negative x squared. So let's just uh, follow the usual steps for curve sketching. So the first uh, step that we're going to take a look at is what is the domain? So for the domain, what we're looking for is we're going to assume that uh, you can plug in any number you want, so all real numbers, and then let's see if there's any problems with any specific numbers. So we're looking for situations where, uh, for example, uh, we don't want a zero in a denominator anywhere, or any, we don't want any uh, negatives inside square roots. And uh, in this function, there's none of that happening, so uh, there are no problem areas, so our domain is all real numbers. Okay, so that's first step. Uh, second step, our x and y intercepts. So let's take a look at the x intercepts. So the x intercepts are where this function will cross the x axis, so where this function is actually going to be equal to zero. And because this function is just an exponential function, we know that exponential functions don't ever cross the x axis. So in this case, there are no x intercepts. There are no x's that you can uh, plug into here that will actually give you a zero coming out of your function. So it never crosses the x-axis, therefore no x-intercepts. Why? Where are the y-intercepts? The y-intercepts happen when you plug in x equals zero into your function. So this is going to be e to the negative zero squared. Of course, zero squared is just zero. Negative zero is zero. e to the zero is just one. So there's a y-intercept at uh, zero, one. Okay. Uh, the next step, uh, the next step that we want to look uh, for when we're doing a uh, curve sketching question are asymptotes. So the first thing will be vertical asymptotes. Uh, vertical asymptotes uh, come from problems in your domain. So are there any um, points uh, that we're excluding from our domain? Are there any problem areas? And of course, because our domain is all real numbers, uh, we have no problem points. Therefore, we have no vertical asymptotes. As far as horizontal asymptotes are, are concerned, uh, to find the horizontal asymptotes, what we do is we take the limit as x goes to infinity of our function, which is e to the negative x squared. And as uh, x gets larger and larger and larger and larger, so you know a thousand, a million, a billion, uh, keep plugging in bigger, bigger x's, what you're getting are bigger and bigger exponents, but they're negative. So e to the negative really, really big numbers are getting closer and closer to zero. So the limit as x goes to infinity is zero. And for the exact same reason, as x goes to negative infinity, our function will also go to zero. So uh, both of these tell us that there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. So the curve, uh, as you get uh, farther and further to the right and further and further to the left, our curve starts going closer and closer and closer to the line y equals zero. Okay, so the fourth part, um, step four, is um, intervals of increase and decrease. So intervals of increase and decrease. Uh, so intervals of increase and decrease have to do with the derivative of our function. So if we take the derivative of our function, our function is e to the negative x squared. So the derivative using the chain rule is e to the negative x squared again, but then we multiply by the derivative of what's in the exponent. And the, uh, the derivative of negative x squared is of course just negative two x. So we end up with um, the, uh, the derivative of our function is negative 2x e to the negative x squared. Okay, so uh, now we want to kind of figure out what are the intervals of increase and what are the intervals of decrease. Uh, so the important thing to notice here, or to make note of when you're uh, figuring this out, is um, what we would like to do is we would like to find all the places that uh, the, the derivative can change from negative to positive or positive to negative. Um, what intervals, or where are the, what are the locations on the real line uh, that things can, can change from increasing to decreasing or vice versa? The only place that th those can happen is where your derivative is zero. Um, so uh, what we would like to know is when is our derivative zero? So when is negative two, so when is negative two x e to the negative x squared, when is that equal to zero? Of course, uh, these uh, in uh, intervals of increase and decrease can also change um, at points of discontinuities or some other kind of weird points. Uh, for example, when there's points that are excluded from our domain. Um, however, we have a nice smooth uh, function here. We have uh, no problems in our domain. Uh, so the only place that things can change from increasing to decreasing are when the derivative is equal to zero. So let's just figure out when the derivative is equal to zero. 
Of course, uh, the only way to make the left-hand side equal to zero is if either this part, the negative two x, either this is zero or this is zero. Um, of course, we can't make e to the negative x squared zero. Uh, we talked about that before. So the only way to actually get this derivative to be zero is if negative two x is zero. Um, and of course, the only way to get negative two x to equal zero is to let x equal zero. So this is the only place, x equals zero is the only place where we can have uh, the function either change from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. Uh, so what we're going to do now is make our increasing and decreasing chart. Uh, so um, on the left hand side we're going to split the real numbers up into intervals um, that are essentially um, divided at these places where things can change. So uh, we go from all the way from negative infinity to the first place things can change which is zero uh, and then we go from zero to the next place that things can change and of course there are no other places uh, so the only other interval we have is from negative infinity to infinity. Now that we have the rows of the table what we can do now is do the columns of the table and the columns are just going to be the pieces that are multiplying together to give us our derivative so the first piece is negative 2x so that will be in one column and the other piece is e to the negative x squared that will be in the other column and uh, what we're interested in is in the derivative and uh, and then we can make maybe a column for is it increase is that interval increasing or decreasing so um, because of this idea that things can only change at the point zero what we can do is we can take any point inside of this interval so for example negative 10 and we can use it as a test point and whatever's happening at negative 10 is going to be happening for this entire interval because the only thing place that things can change is actually at zero so let's take a test point of negative 10 we plug it into this function, negative 2x, we would get uh, positive 20, and positive 20 is of course positive. e to the negative x squared at negative 10 is positive. In fact, e to the negative x squared is positive everywhere. And so what we have for our uh, derivative in this region is a positive times a positive, which means the derivative is positive, which means in this uh, region, the graph is increasing. In this region, same kind of idea, we're gonna pick a test, uh, Point. So let's say x is equal to 20, for example. Um, when we use x equals 20 into our, our columns, what we find out here is this would be negative 40, which is a negative number. Uh, we already know what this is. So negative times a positive is a negative. So our derivative in this interval is negative, which means our function is decreasing on this interval. Um, now we can look for, air, for part five. We're gonna look for um, points of maximum or minimum. And so we're looking for places where the derivative changes from increasing to decreasing or decreasing to increasing. And of course we see here at the number x equals zero, which is kind of like the divider here, our um, function is going from something that is increasing to something that is decreasing. So it's going to go from something that looks like this to something that looks like this, which means we can conclude that there is probably, or there is a maximum at x equals zero. So there's a max at x equals zero, and this is a local max. Okay, um, there are no mins. Mins would happen when things change from decreasing to increasing. Uh, so this is the only uh, local max or local min that we have. All right, part six. Part six is the same kind of idea, only what we do is we are concerned about the second derivative. So we're concerned about uh, concavity as in concave up or concave down. So we know that f prime uh, of x is equal to uh, negative 2x e to the negative x squared. So let's now figure out the second derivative. So we're going to take the derivative of this. This is a product rule because we have one function here and another function here. Uh, so for the product rule, I'm going to leave the second function alone, e to the negative x squared, and I'm going to take the derivative of the first function. The derivative of negative 2x is just negative 2. And uh, to finish the product rule, I'm going to add what I would get if I left the uh, first function alone, which is negative 2x. And then I multiply by the derivative of the second function, which is, as we've kind of done before, e to the negative x squared times the derivative of the uh, negative x squared using the chain rule, and I get negative 2x. And if I simplify that, I get uh, negative 2x uh, times negative 2x is 4x squared e to the negative x squared minus this part uh, 2 e to the negative x squared 
And I notice that uh, each of these uh, terms in our second derivative uh, have an e to the negative x squared in it, so I'm actually just going to factor those out just to simplify my life. And I have uh, 4x squared uh, minus 2. And I also see that there's still actually a 2 left over, so I could have actually made my life even easier by removing the 2s, and I end up with 2x squared minus 1. So this is our second derivative. So just like we did with the first derivative when asking for intervals of increase and decrease, the only place that our function can change from concave up to concave down or vice versa is when this second derivative is zero or doesn't exist. And the second derivative is nice and smooth. Uh, there's no kind of bad uh, x values that we can't use here. Uh, so the only place that the, our second derivative uh, can change from positive negative or negative positive uh, would be when the second derivative is zero. So let's figure out when does f when does the second derivative of zero or of uh, second derivative of f equals zero, and that will happen when we have two e to the negative x squared times two x squared minus one. So that's the second derivative. But when does this equal zero? For the same kind of reasons as before, um, the only way to make uh, this left hand side zero is if one of these two pieces, because they're multiplying each other, one of these two pieces must be zero. Now the first one can't be zero because it's two multiplying by uh, an exponential and an exponential is always just a number so you're always just going to get a number out of this a positive number out of this uh, so the only way to actually make this second derivative zero is if 2x squared minus 1 equals zero so we have we need that 2x squared minus 1 must equal zero and of course I can just solve this uh, for x I bring the 1 over and I have x squared uh, is 1 half which means x has got to be equal to plus or minus uh, 1 over the square root of 2 Okay, I just took the square root of both sides, and of course the square root of a fraction is the square root of the top divided by the square root of the bottom, and the square root of one is just one, so that's why it's just kind of one on the top. So these are the only places that uh, our, our function's second derivative can change from positive to negative or negative to positive, so we're going to do the exact same trick that we did um, in the previous page. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to make a table, and we're going to divide up the real line into intervals going from uh, in between these kind of breaking points. So we go from negative infinity to the first breaking point, which is uh, negative one over root two. And then we go from negative infinity, or sorry, we go from uh, this breaking point to the next breaking point, negative one over root two to the next breaking point, which is one over root two. And then we go from the that breaking point to the next one. There is no next one, so we'll just go to uh, infinity. So these are our three intervals. Um, so these are going to be our three rows of our table. And the columns are going to be um, the pieces of our second derivative. So for example, our second derivative is just up here. Uh, the first piece that is multiplying together is 2e to the negative x squared. And the second piece is 2x squared minus 1, 2x squared minus 1. Uh, so these are our two pieces that we multiply together to get our second derivative. And uh, just going to continue this messy looking table. And so what we're actually interested in is what is the uh, sign of the second derivative? And of course, is this concave up or concave down? Okay. So um, in this interval, we can just pick a, a random kind of number in this interval. So let's take maybe negative 100. Um, if we take negative 100 and plug it into this first part of our second derivative, what we get is a, a positive number because any exponential uh, is positive times two is a positive. So this is positive in this region. In fact, it's positive for all the regions. In this region, uh, again, let's say we had negative 100, we would have say negative 100 squared, which is quite large times two, which is even larger minus one uh, so this uh, would end up being a positive um, if we plugged in 100 into there. Um, in this region, maybe uh, we can take a test point being 0. If we plugged in 0 into this, we'd get uh, 2 times 0 squared, which is 0. Minus 1 is minus 1. And of course, that is negative. And here we could take a really big number like a million. Uh, plug that in. We have a million squared, which is really, really big, times 2, which is really, really big, minus 1. So that's still going to stay a positive. So positive times a positive is a positive. So the second derivative is positive in this region. Uh, positive times a negative is negative. So it's uh, the second derivative is negative in that region. And the positive times a positive is a positive. Uh, and so the uh, second derivative is positive in that region. In the positive regions, we know that these are concave up. And in the negative regions, we know 
but that means concave down. So now we know what is happening as far as concavity on our, all our intervals, and we can uh, now make uh, try to figure out where some inflection points are happening. Um, so inflection points, uh, it's just gonna be part seven here. In, inflection points are where um, things change from concave up to concave down or vice versa. As long as that point is also, it's also the function is also continuous at that point, um, we don't really have any worries about continuity in our question because our function is nice and smooth with no big problems in it. Um, so anytime that the uh, anytime that the concavity changes from up to down or down to up, that's going to guarantee us an inflection point. So here at negative one over root two, and here at one over root two, uh, things change from up to down here. So there's definitely an inflection point here, and uh, the concavity changes from down to up here. So this is also an inflection point. So what we can conclude here are the inflection points are at x equals positive and negative one over square root two. So now we have all of the information we need to graph a function. So let's go ahead and uh, graph it. So um, I know it's, my function is an exponential, so I know it, uh, and we also know that there's no uh, x-intercepts. So I'm gonna try to draw this as, as well as I can or as neatly as I can. So uh, we don't really have any need for the negative part of the y-axis because we know that there are no x-intercepts. Uh, so our graph never actually crosses the x-axis. Uh, uh, the first thing that we uh, noted was that as uh, we had a, um, a point uh, y-intercept at 0, 1, uh, we also knew that as x uh, went to negative infinity, our function goes to negative, inf or our function is going to zero, and as x goes to positive infinity, our function is going to zero. That was uh, from our horizontal asymptotes. And we also happen to know that uh, our function is increasing. Um, so I'm actually going to put in some um, other points here. We're going to have maybe this is going to be negative one over square root two. So you should always put in your inflection points and uh, your Oops, you should put in your inflection points. You should also always put in uh, your maxes and mins. Uh, so you should really always just uh, make sure you're labeling any of your really important points um, on your graph. So we know that there are inflection points here to here, and we also know that the, the graph is increasing until zero and then decreasing after zero. So this is kind of going to look like a little bit of a, a hat maybe or something along those lines. Increasing on the left side, decreasing on the right side. However, from our graph up here, we know that it's concave up, so it looks like a, a U shape, until uh, negative one over square root two. So it is going to look like a little bit of a U shape increasing until uh, negative one over square root two, and then it's gonna change to concave down. However, it's still gonna be increasing, so it's gonna be uh, concave up until here, Oops, let me try that one more time. It's gonna be concave up, and then it's gonna be concave down. As soon as it hits negative one half, it kinda of goes from concave up to concave down. And uh, we also know that it's concave down all the way to uh, one over root two. So let's just keep uh, going here. It's gonna be concave down all the way to, to one over root two, and then concave up, changes the concave up at one over root two. Um, so we have this kind of, uh, it should actually look much nicer than this. Um, however, um, with the stylus, it's, it's not the easiest thing to draw. And so this would be um, a reasonable graph. Um, I guess one other thing that you could do if you, you wanted to, it's probably a good idea, is to actually plug in uh, and figure out what the y values of our inflection points are. So let me just go ahead and do that. Um, when x equals uh, 1 over root 2, I have y is equal to e to the negative 1 over root 2 squared, which is e to the negative 1 half. And when uh, x is equal to um, negative 1 over root 2, I have e to the negative negative 1 over root 2 squared, which is, again, e to the negative 1 half. Uh, and so if, if we really want to, what we can do is we can say that this inflection point here, this oops, so this inflection point here and this inflection point here is at the point e to the negative one half. And that's it.